going to be speaking mainly about the past today, given the nature of this particular event here today. So uh, this, is, this is a slide that basically is from a forthcoming website, the project, and uh, it represents the past, the present and the future, because that's from the opening of the War Memorial in 1925. Uh, first I'll say about the project, uh, we're uh, lottery funded, uh, Heritage Lottery funded, as well as from Dundas City Council and the Local Regeneration Forum, we've all put money in. And uh, it's a long term project, but we're kicking it off with doing up the law, basically. And we'll speak about that more as we go. But first of all, I'll give you some facts. I'm sure you're aware of Dundee Law. It's pretty much the only one of today's talks that you can see from outside the window if you're sitting at the right side of this building. So it's 572 feet above sea level, 174 metres. And uh, a nice start is that if you go from sea level, so roughly the city square, and walk up once a week to the top of the law, by the end of the year you'll have gone the height of Mount Everest. <laughs> so, that's a good way to keep fit. <laughs> TripAdvisor rates the law number three visit attraction in Dundee, or just behind the Discovery and Verdant Works, but I think that's, that's pretty good. Uh, it is a historical symbol of the city. I've got my uh, city council logo on, and that, of course, is Dundee Law. So it's been that way for a long time, actually, that Dundee Law has been synonymous with the city of Dundee. And it is a local geodiversity site, which uh, is to reflect the importance of it in terms of its geology. Uh, it's largely made of this hard igneous rock called andesite, and that is because it's made from volcanic processes. Although, and this is where the controversy starts, it isn't actually a volcano. It's not even a volcanic plug, but few people from Dundee believe me about that because everybody's been brought up for generations being told it's an extinct volcano. <laughs> However, it's not. But we can go back as far as the Bronze Age in terms of human habitation. And uh, we've got this map here. This was a uh, Rydent's survey from about 1990. And you probably can't see it too well, so I'm just going to make a couple of those bits bigger. This is the area uh, up in the top left, if I can get this thing working right. Yep, there you go, just up here. And uh, this is, says ancient weapons and human remains found here. So that's up, which is now actually underneath one of the allotments on the law. So we're not going to get much chance to ever do that one again, I don't think. Uh, and the other one, just down in this corner here, is where it says Bronze Age Kist. And that was uh, the site where we think they managed to recover this particular object, which is now the National Museum of Scotland. And uh, that was originally thought to be a jet button, but I think Alison Sheridan now believes it's actually canal coal, which probably means it's local. But uh, it's interesting to think that uh, it was being used as a ceremonial site as far back as the Bronze Age. Moving forward a little, we go to the Iron Age, and the early history we have is a little more complete, because uh, the Bronze Age stuff was excavated long before modern techniques, so unfortunately we don't have an awful lot of information about what was found. There's a bit more about the Iron Age, uh, the last dig that was done there was actually Gard did that in 1993, so we do have some reasonably good, accurate information about the, the actual Iron Age Hellford that was there. And I've got a little uh, video clip which I can help you with. This is worth watching. So this explains about the Hellford in much better details than I can once I stop clicking things. And uh, I'll explain a little bit what was found there while we go. Obviously, some of this is on, on screen for you as well. But uh, this is an excellent reconstruction, which will be on the forthcoming website. Uh, it was put together by Tim Baxter and Alice Watterson. Uh, and was on show at the Celts exhibition in the McManus Galleries. But uh, they managed to find, uh, in that dig in 1993, there was quite a lot of uh, animal remains found, quite a lot of charcoal as well. Uh, this... Uh, Theotite lamp uh, was actually found during the construction of the War Memorial in 1925. So uh, it's a very impressive piece of film, so I'll, I'll show you all of that. And it, uh, also another thing that was uh, verified at that dig was that the hill fort was vitrified. That had always been the local legend, and they've got vitrified stone which is reputed to come from the law in the McManus galleries. But uh, <coughs> Stephen Driscoll was able to find that there was actually vitrified stone at the right stratigraphical, I can't say that, the right layer. Uh, there was also this whalebone found, which is nice with the idea of Dundee's continuity, the fact that there was a whalebone then. And there was Samian ware as well. 
I think there's a few examples of seeming where a couple of which are still retained. And there's a recreation of what it was like when it was uh, on fire. And uh, again, nobody's really sure whether it was intentionally destroyed or whether it was uh, by accident. I'm not an archaeologist, so perhaps archaeologists will have better ideas of that than I do. But it's a very impressive piece of film. And uh, yeah, quite a lot of vitrified stone appears to have come from it. Okay, I shall minimise that again back to the presentation. Okay. Uh, so there isn't an awful lot left, but the, the dates that were found were consistent with being in use from about 500 to 400 BC, and then again a period about the Roman occupation of Scotland, about 100 AD. And again, yeah, the Roman body was found on the summit. That's probably the YouTube thing carrying on, isn't it? There we go. It's the problem with putting in these sophisticated things, isn't it? Okay. Right. Moving forward, we've got to medieval Dundee, and this is Pont's map from the 1580s or 1590s, and I just want to give you an idea how far outside Dundee the law actually was for pretty much all of history. It was always a symbol of the city, but uh, there's not an awful lot of uh, link in terms of actually being in Dundee up until a lot later than that. Um, there's not a lot of stuff to show you from medieval Dundee either. Perhaps that's because the site has been quite intensively used since that period. But all we've got is this rogue piece of medieval pottery, which Derek Hall reckons is 13th to 14th century and probably from England. But as it was found in one of the allotments, there's not even a guarantee it's ever from the lot. So uh, there is a very scant amount of material to tell you from the medieval era. Looking then to the 16th, 17th century, no one's quite sure either if the uh, bastions at the corners and the ramparts that were associated with them were actually from the civil war in the 17th century or the rough wooing of the 16th century, but uh, Stephen Driscoll in his paper on the excavation makes a very convincing case for it being the rough wooing. So that's the 1540s rather than the 1640s. But certainly there's no clay pipes there, so that's one of the things you could use to uh, make that more likely. And uh, it's probable that the English were sieging Duddup Castle, which is just below the summit of the wall. So it would seem to be likely it's the 16th century they're from. Uh, there is the, the local legend that Bonnie Dundee flew the Jacobite uh, flag from the law in 1689 before he went off to Kelly Cranky, but there's no evidence to back that up, but it is local folklore, so it is feasible, but there's nothing to support it. And I do have this, this uh, little drawing for you as well, which is Sletzer's The Prospect of Ye Town of Dundee uh, from the east, and you can see the law way over to the right there, which gives you the idea, the hill town leading up towards it, gives you an idea what Dundee was like. Moving forward again, though, we'll go forward to the industrial era and the railway that was placed. And the plans were first formulated for a freight route between Dundee and Forfarshire in 1825. Several routes were surveyed, but the chosen route led to the Belmont estates of Lord Warncliffe, who was one of the main shareholders. And the idea was that this would take a uh, freight all the way from Dundee to Newtile, and it would be fairly easy to do. They had hopes of making profit, actually, from putting in the tunnel that was put up the law. And the idea was they would, because it was horse-drawn in the early days, they would have to uh, lift up the hill and then they would get the energy from the top of the hill to get it all the way down into Angus. The, the Act was passed into law in 1826, which does make it one of the oldest services in the world. Of course, it's long since discontinued. There is a picture of the law tunnel. If you can't make it out there, I'll point it out. It's just over at this part here. And that just went just right beside where St David's High Kirk is now. Uh, there's only the last 30 metres or so which anybody could access now. The rest of it has been filled in. The tunnel was dug through the east side of the law, opened in 1831. As I say, the plan was that they were going to make money from that, because they thought once they hit all that hard volcanic rock, they could then use it for quarrying, and they'd make a profit off the whole enterprise. In fact, what happened was because they went to the east side, they went to the uh, sedimentary rock that was deposited by glaciation. So they had to actually then show it up, and that ended up costing them a lot of money. So they did lose money on the venture. 
the Lockheed deviation was then used from the 1860s because obviously by that stage the uh, technology had advanced enough that they no longer needed to lift it via horse further up the hill. So uh, they no longer needed to go up the law, so it was bypassed from there. The tunnel was later used for growing mushrooms around about the end of the Victorian era. And uh, that darkness must have made it quite difficult as an air raid shelter, but it was used in World War II, at least uh, supposed to have been used for, as an air raid shelter. But I don't know, I've never spoken to anyone who's ever been in it in terms of as an air raid shelter, but if you know anyone, please let me know. It was closed in the 1960s, although uh, generations of children before that and after that still could climb into various little holes and get into the tunnel and dared each other to do it. There were houses built upon the entrance in the 1980s though, and that's precluded any chance of that happening again. Although, there is a Facebook campaign to get it reopened, and the railways still own it, but uh, they're checking into its safety now, and someday it may be open again as a visit attraction, if it ends up being deemed safe enough. In terms of its industrial usage, I did say it was quite well used as a site. It was pretty extensively quarried, I've got a map of that just in a second. Uh, there were also some horse troughs, which were leading up to the top of the summit, which is understandable again, given how much it was used in use. And then it became the city tip. They thought to themselves, the people of Dundee at the time, there's a good place to put our city dump, as I'm one of the local beauty spots. I suppose not much has changed in many ways. Uh, this is one of the boundary stones that used to go between the land of Lord Duddup and Dundee. There's a few of them still left that you can visit if you go up the law. There's only a few you can see nowadays. There used to be right round it, as you'll see on the map coming up. This is part of the old smithy, which is on the north side at the foot of the hill. And uh, there's quite a lot of stonework and various monumental pieces of masonry which are now unidentified. So it's an excellent candidate if everybody, anybody who with skills were ever able to do some industrial archaeology there, I should say. And here's the map of the 1902-1903 town plan. You can see the quarries there, just to the north. And the tip actually ended up on top of the, the quarry over to the right of that there. So it was this one here that came the city dump. In effect, but it was quite extensively quarried at the time, and the stone from there was uh, igneous, so it went into a lot of the railway sidings as well as the um, roads around the area. In fact, uh, the purchase is worth pointing out because uh, it was Lord Durrup's land and it was farmed quite, quite a lot in the 19th century. In fact, it was a dairy farm on the site up until the 1940s or thereabouts. So uh, there are some people who've, who've been able to tell me they remember it being a farm. So uh, that was still in living memory that it was a farm, which is a bit odd, I think, for those of us who've grown up with it as a recreational place, that it was uh, farmed still relatively recently. But it was only a bought by Dundee in about 1875. They started 1878, it finally got signed over as a recreational place for the people of Dundee. But as I say, they did, they did use it in various other ways as well. More recently, in the 20th century, uh, the War Memorial was opened in 1925 in a large ceremony. Uh, the War Memorial itself has got quite a sad history in that it was going to be a much more extensive complex and a more impressive monument, but money ran out. And they had to basically cut a few corners and it ended up with what we have today, which uh, rather than being splendid Aberdeen granite, is actually Cornish granite, which uh, apparently was slightly cheaper. So again, not much changes to the history. Little corners got cut at the time. Uh, I'll speak about the World War II pillbox just in a minute. It is now disused, and uh, work is being done on it now. It was a grazing site, though, uh, partly because it was a farm, up until the 1950s, and it was gradually forested over the 50s right through to about the 1970s. The police telecommunications mast, which is actually the highest point on the hill, was put in in the 1950s as well. And I know there's been at times people saying they want rid of the telecommunications mast and they think it's a bit of an eyesore. But uh, I don't think it's going anywhere because the police uh, certainly say they need it. So it's staying. Uh, trails were put in round about the summit, round about the slopes. The car park was extended in 1977 and the viewing platform was started. And there were leaflets brought out to support this in the 70s. And then again in the mid-90s, EU funding upgraded the whole area and the new steps, as they were then, were put in. A quick word about the pillbox, just before we go any further. Here it is here. It's an interesting thing, the pillbox, because a little bit of archival research from some of the people on the project has uncovered no mention of it 
in any of the war records of the time. No mention of when it was built, why it was built, the money put forward for it or anything. So it must have been about 1941 or thereabouts, but we can't quite tell when exactly. Uh, this is what it looked like up until very recently, quite extensively graffitized and uh, just used as a dump, basically. Again, by generations of Dundee kids using it as a drinking den, really. But it's a way to be cleaned out, has been cleaned out, and it's a way to actually turn it into a bat roost. So that's going to be a bit of a change for it, and it will make the area secure for future reference, uh, for future generations. More recently, there's been a bit of archaeology done as well. Some members here may remember the Dundee New Tail Railway celebration, 150th anniversary, where uh, the McManus Galleries organised a uh, dig up there. I don't know exactly how that went, but I'm sure there are some people here who will remember it. And this is a map of uh, Stephen Driscoll's dig back in 93. Over uh, these parts here is where he put his trenches in. So uh, there's still an awful lot of the summit which hasn't been <coughs> excavated, but to be fair, an awful lot of the summit has been so much built upon successive generations that there probably wouldn't be an awful lot to find up there. And the, I'll finish off by speaking about the current development. The steps in the past have been upgraded. This is what they looked like back about two years ago, and this is what they look like now. So as you can see, there's a huge difference. And if you haven't been up the law for a while, I would urge you to go and visit and make use of some of the paths and the steps leading up. There have been some wildflower meadows put in as well. Most recently, this rather splendid poppy meadow has been put in, thanks to a donation from a member of the public and uh, there's going to be more work done on these wildflower meadows over the next couple of years. There's new signage to the law from the city centre and also some signs of way to go on the law as well, including an update of the interpretation panels at the summit. Uh, we're going to have a website which should be coming out hopefully by the end of this month and uh, that will be well, well worth seeing. There's quite a lot of historical information on that, including a trip through the tunnel and aerial photography and yeah, it just it should be really good. We've also got some leaflets that are going to be coming out as well, including the heritage trails around the slopes, and that will be fairly soon as well, probably within the next year. The tree thinning aspect of it, we occasionally get people telling me that uh, they'd like to see some of the trees taken off the summit, and uh, we're going to be taking some of them off. It's going to be up to about 30% of the trees, so it's not going to be all of them by any means, but some of them have reached the natural end of their life cycle anyway. So there's going to be some thin thinned out more than anything. Looking at the future, uh, we have got Friends of the Law Group that now meets once a month. We've got a committee up and running, and uh, we're always looking for new people to join. So if anybody fancies being a friend of the law, uh, just check on the website or get in touch with me or look for the Friends of the Law webpage, which is the, the Facebook webpage for that. We're doing wildlife surveys. I've been doing some of those. Quite a lot of volunteers have been assisting as well. Uh, bumblebees, butterflies, birds, basically. Uh, some of the plants have been monitored as well. We have got a green flag there now. We've done this fifth green flag site, which is the high standard of excellence of uh, outdoor areas. So it's very good that we've got that now. We hope to keep it. We've got, had some events up on the law. We're definitely looking to have some more. This is last summer when the Country Seed Rangers were there, letting kids know about the nature of the site, as well as the best dog training viewpoint in the city, <laughs> as it was at the day. And that is the Heritage Project itself, which uh, certainly will be running after the end of the actual initial couple of years of the thing, of the project itself, because we're wanting the public to take it forward. And the other thing we need is you, people of the Dundee and the surrounding area. We'd like people to get involved. If you can think of anything that the law should be used for, or you think it shouldn't be used for, please let me know. And there's my contact details. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you.